All right, trying to figure out which, aha, uh -huh. I think it's this one. Okay, okay. So um, I chose to uh, cover stroke for you guys because I was the stroke champion at the first hospital I worked at. I was only a nurse for three years and they put me in charge of um, educating the inpatient units and the ER on signs and symptoms, interventions, and then I audited their charts, part of the, um, part of us gaining magnet status. So I've seen this a million times and in the South where I worked, uh, it's considered the stroke belt. You have a lot more stroke incidents across the United States and down from the middle down. Uh, a lot of it is modifiable uh, risk factors. Um, and I'm sorry, I just put the PowerPoint up there today. I thought it was up there. Um, so Donette covered the um, neural function of the brain and a lot of this is gonna be kind of um, repeating that to you in a way you can understand where if there's a dysfunction, it's in that same area and hopefully it'll start to click for you. Um, a stroke is ischemia to any part of the brain or a hemorrhage into the brain that results in death of brain cells, um, also known as a brain attack or a CVA. Um, and um, there's a lot of oxygen and blood that's and glucose um, that neurons need to function. So any interruption can cause um, stroke. The severity of the loss of function varies according to the location and extent of brain damage. Um, functions such as movement, sensation, thinking, and talking, or even emotions that are controlled by the affected area of the brain are lost or impaired. Can be long-term disabilities, like part of the body a whole side of the body not functioning, and then with rehab, some um, function is regained. Some people have no uh, residual effects from stroke at all. It is the fifth most common cause of death in the United States. An estimated 7 million people over the age of 20 in the United States have had a stroke. Um, now that our population is getting older, we're going to see more incidents of stroke. Um, about 34% of strokes occur in people younger than 65 years old. And then uh, more than 137,000 deaths occur annually from stroke. Um, the most effective way to decrease stroke incidence is prevention and teaching. The big part of what we do as nurses is educating our patients to make their quality of life better and the incidence of long-term illness less. Um, uh, modifiable risk factors. Um, your stroke risk doubles with each decade after the age of 55 and is more common in men, but more women die from it. Um, and then ethnicity plays a part as well. Um, more women tend to die from stroke because they live longer and have the, have more opportunity to suffer a stroke. And uh, family, family incidents of stroke also contributes to your risk. And those are non-modifiable. Uh, modifiable risk factors, hypertension, heart disease, serum cholesterol, smoking, obesity, sleep apnea, metabolic syndrome, lack of physical exercise, poor diet, drug and alcohol abuse. Um, we kind of question our patients when we first see them, either inpatient, ER, whichever uh, setting you're in. And um, when they talk about three of these symptoms, I always say, you know, um, that's a kind of three strike you're out thing. You're really putting yourself at risk for a stroke biggest thing you can tell them is to follow up with a primary care provider, take your medicine as prescribed, and um, definitely you want to give them smoking cessation. Um, also, um, hormones, taking hormones puts you at risk too, so birth control pills. Um, some women after menopause take uh, hormones for their symptoms. I'm going to talk to them about the risk factors there too. Um, and then as one of your clinical assignments, you're assisting an RN with health screening at a health fair. Which individual is at greatest risk for experience of stroke? 46-year-old white female with hypertension and oral contraceptive use for 10 years. A 58-year-old white male salesman who has a total cholesterol level of 285. 
a 42-year-old African-American female with diabetes mellitus who has smoked for over 30 years, or a 62-year-old African-American male with hypertension who's 35 pounds overweight. Um, thank D. All of these people are at risk, it looks like, but this individual on D has five risk factors. His age, African-American, male, hypertension, and overweight. Count them up. Yeah, count up your risk factors and, and then try to knock them out. Um, and most strokes happen in the circle of Willis. And a history of a TIA, they, some people call it a mini stroke, uh, is associated with an increased risk for stroke. It's a transient episode of neurological dysfunction caused by focal brain, spinal cord, or retinal ischemia, but without acute infarct. You've got your circle of Willis. Um, a and P stuff there. It's important to seek a patient. To it's important to teach a patient to seek treatment for any stroke symptoms. A lot of people will tell you that they've had these symptoms several times in the past, and they just went away, so they never did anything about it. Um, doctors typically gonna want to put them on some uh, aspirin and Plavix or such like that, and then have some. Um, CAT scans or MRIs done to see if there's any permanent damage to the brain. Symptoms usually last less than an hour, and there's no way to predict the outcome. A uh, third do not experience another event, a third have additional TIAs, and a third progress to stroke. Uh, strokes are classified based on underlying pathophysiology findings. You've got thrombotic or embolic. And then uh, with hemorrhagic intracerebral and subarachnoid. Uh, with a thrombotic stroke, the process of clot formation results in a narrowing of the lumen, which blocks the passage of the blood through the artery. And embolic stroke, an embolus is a blood clot or other debris circulating in the blood. When it reaches an artery in the brain that's too narrow to pass through, it lodges there and blocks the flow of blood. So either way, it's blocking the flow of blood to further... Um, portions of the brain, and that's where your symptoms are going to occur from. And then hemorrhagic stroke is a burst of a blood vessel, allowing blood to seep into and damage brain tissues until clotting shuts off the leak. Um, ischemic strokes result from inadequate blood flow to brain from partial or complete occlusion of an artery, and they can be thrombotic or embolo embolic. And there's such a thing as embolic storm, where they have several different embolic um, at the same time, uh, and then present with many different symptoms that kind of come and go. Thrombotic strokes occur from injury to a blood vessel wall and formation of a blood clot, narrowing of a blood vessel, and they are the most common cause of a stroke, usually hypertension and diabetes. Um, and many times they're preceded by the TIAs or mini strokes. Um, the extent of the stroke depends on how fast it comes on, the size of the damaged area, and presence of collateral circulation. Um, there's a small vessel disease in the brain. You're not going to have a lot of collateral circulation because if you block the blood flow to, a, to one area of the brain, there's not a lot of other uh, vessels that can carry blood to that portion of the brain. You're going to have more damage. An embolic stroke occurs when an embolus lodges in and occludes a cerebral artery, results in infarction and edema of the area supplied by the involved vessel, and it's the second most common cause of stroke. Um, sudden onset with severe clinical manifestations. Um, the patient... Sorry. Um... Patient doesn't have as many warning signs. They usually remain conscious, um, and it's amount. Their prognosis is related to amount of brain tissue deprived of blood supply. They then they commonly reappear. A hemorrhagic stroke is less. You don't see it as often, um, but the prognosis is not as good. The brain tissue itself um, has bleeding intracerebral or intraparenchymal. And then uh, you also have subarachnoid space or ventricle bleeding. This is bleeding within the brain caused by rupture of a vessel with sudden onset of symptoms. But the progression can be slower because it uh, 
depends on how fast the tissue is bleeding and how big of an area um, accumulates with blood. 30 day mortality rate of 40 to 80 percent. And here's a picture. Um, that's uh, old blood pooled in a portion of the brain. That's pretty big. And that's a lateral ventricle that's occluded. No. Depending on how fast it happened, because you've got the swelling in the brain and whether or not the brain is able to absorb it or, but it, you know, it looks like it's stayed in that spot. And it's hard to tell what's deeper down in there, but um, the whole, your whole brain tissue is going to shift if there's too much pressure from that blood. Once there's a midline shift, the mortality rate is extremely high. And recovery is very slim. They usually, if they do, if they do live, they usually uh, have those symptoms for life, and they can be a vegetable in the biggest um, occurrences. You know, most blood. Uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, hypertension is the most common cause. Hemorrhage occurs during activity because the blood pressure goes up, and if they're not used to activity, blood pressure is going to skyrocket when they do move around. Um, sudden onset with progression over minutes to hours, and the extent of your symptoms varies and depends on the amount, location, and duration of bleeding. And then a uh, patient can also have vascular malformations, coagulation disorders. They can be on an anticoagulant that's going to increase their risk of bleeding, trauma to the brain, brain tumors, ruptured aneurysms, um, all kinds of different risks. The biggest thing you can do is eliminate the modifiable risks in your patient. Um, and then uh, intracerebral hemorrhage is going to manifest in neurological deficits, a massive headache. They usually complain of a headache like they've never felt in their life, um, which is a difficult uh, symptom when they come into the ER. They complain of it as your patient because a headache is a headache, so you don't automatically think massive headache might need an immediate CT scan. It could be a stroke. You're usually just thinking, oh, your blood pressure is high. Uh, they can have nausea or vomiting, decreased levels of consciousness, and then hypertension. Approximately half of intracerebral hemorrhages occur in the putman and internal capsule. Uh, central white matter, thalamus, cerebral hemispheres, and the pons. Um, and the nausea and vomiting usually goes with the headache, which is also kind of hard because migraines are similar. Nausea, vomiting with a migraine. Um, subarachnoid hemorrhages, intracranial Intracranial bleeding into cerebrospinal fluid filled space between the arachnoid and pia matter, commonly caused by rupture of a cerebral aneurysm, trauma, or drug abuse. So it's not as common because you think about the incidence of hypertension versus the, in, the incidence of a cerebral aneurysm or brain trauma. Um, cerebral aneurysms are usually located in the circle of Lewis where all those vessels join. Um, and it's a silent killer. Loss of consciousness may or may not occur. Uh, high mortality rate. Survivors often suffer significant complications and deficits. Um, this happened to my cousin's wife. She was 22. Just know she was fine one minute. Next minute, she was completely unconscious and she never regained consciousness. She ended up dying. So it, and I hear those stories a lot. Young people, not a lot of warning signs because nobody's just doing an MRI of their brain to rule out if they have an AV malformation or some such thing that may, um, you know, burst. Um, PD is a 73-year-old man who was admitted to the hospital with right-sided paresis and expressive aphasia. He had been experiencing periods of confusion, right-sided weakness, and slurred speech for the past several weeks. These episodes were brief and resolved completely within an hour. No treatment was sought. He has a history of COPD, a myocardial infarction 15 years ago, and AFib. Over the first 24 hours of admission, neurological deficits gradually progressed. By day two, he has right-sided paresthesias, hemiparesis, and global aphasia. What is probably the cause of his stroke? AFib's big um, risk. So which kind of a stroke would he probably have had? Embolic, good. Um, he also has risk factors for a thrombotic stroke. He could have been having TIAs all along. 
There are preventable risk factors that could have been modified, such as this hypertension, and the AFib should have been treated with anticoagulants. Could a stroke have been prevented? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. If he can adhere to uh, what the doctors tell him to take, such as an antihypertensive or an anticoagulant. If he's following up and having his numbers checked, if he's on Coumadin, he's going to need to make sure that it is actually um, therapeutic and not too low or too high, which puts him at risk for what kind of a stroke of his, um, the hemorrhagic. If he's got too big of a bleeding risk and he's not following up and he's got a, an INR of greater than 10, then he could bleed out through the brain as well. Um, clinical manifestations of a stroke depend on where the stroke has occurred, which Donette's um, neuro video, even though it's a little hard to hear, is going to tell you more about which cranial nerves control what and which areas of the brain control what. So this will be a little bit of a repeat, but um, neural tissue destruction is basis for neurological dysfunction, and it may affect many of your body functions mm -hmm. related to the arteries involved and the half of the brain it supplies. Time of the onset of symptoms and length of period of ischemia is important. Uh, manifestations of right brain and left brain strokes. Right brain damage, you're going to be paralyzed on your left side, hemiplegia. Um, you're going to have left-sided neglect where you don't even know that that part of your body exists, really. They just kind of avoid it. Spatial and perceptual deficits, they tend to fall a lot. Um, tends to deny or minimize their problems. They think they're fine and try to stand up even though one side of their body is completely flaccid. Uh, rapid performance, short attention span. They're very impulsive at times. Um, huge fall risks, impaired judgment, and they have no concept of time. Yes, right brain damage, stroke on the right side of the brain. You tell somebody... Oh, when you're ready to get up. Yep. Okay. And then they get up. Yep. Um, and then left brain damage, stroke on the left side of the brain, is going to have a right-sided par paralysis, hemiplegia, um, impaired speech and language aphasias. A lot of times they know exactly what's going on, but they just can't vocalize it. And it's extremely frustrating for them. So don't assume that if they can't speak their minds that they have no idea what's going on. Um, and then impaired right and left discrimination, slow performance. They're very cautious, very fearful, and they're aware of their deficits. They suffer through a lot of depression and anxiety with that side. Um, impaired comprehension related to language and math. Did anybody watch um, Donette's thing yet? Do they know what area of the brain would cause that? Impaired comprehension related to language, math, speech. Wernicke's or then Broca's area, if they're unable to put out their speech, sometimes take in what someone else is saying. Uh, clinical manifestations, motor function, the most obvious effect of a stroke uh, include impairment of mobility, respiratory function, swallowing and speech, gag reflex, self-care abilities. One of the first things we check when they have any kind of symptoms is whether or not they can swallow because it sometimes is um, hard to visualize, you know. They'll have one side of their body paralyzed, but you don't think about the fact that one side of the stroke, or one side of the throat can be impaired and they'll choke on everything that they try to take in. I'm not so sure that they're that strict about it here, but where I went to state court, the stroke center, you did not get nothing. Nothing, yeah. Most of your doctors will write that, NPO, until the nursing swallow screen has been um, passed. If you did, you were trouble. Right, yeah, because then they can suffer through um, aspiration pneumonia because you haven't noticed that that could be a problem. Um, characteristic motor deficits, loss of skilled voluntary movement, uh, where they can look at their hand, they can't make their hand move, or it's very... Um, very impaired. They have no control over it. Impairment of in integration of movements, alterations in muscle tone, alterations in reflexes. They can be hypo, they can have hyporeflexia or hyperreflexia where there uh, almost looks like a spasm and they can't stop. 
Then there's an initial period of flaccidity, which is absolute lack of movement. They don't respond to even sharp um, pokes to that. No nerve, res no nerve response or muscular response. It may last from days to several weeks. It's related to the amount of nerve damage. Spasticity of muscles sometimes follows that flaccidity stage. And it's related to interruptions of upper motor neuron influence. Because the pyramidal pathway crosses at the level of the medulla, a lesion on one side of the brain is going to affect motor affection on the opposite side of the body. So it's contralateral. And then communication manifestations. Aphasia occurs when stroke damages dominant hemisphere of the brain. So it does, you'll see the doctors write in their assessments whether or not the patient is left-handed or right-handed. Because it depends on which brain, which side of their brain is the dominant side. Uh, receptive aphasia is a loss of comprehension of what everyone's telling them. And expressive aphasia, loss of production of speech and language. And then global is where they have total inability to communicate. They can't, under they can't take anything in and they can't put anything out. <clears throat> the left hemisphere is dominant for language skills in a right-handed person and in most left-handed people. Aphasia occurs when a stroke damages the dominant hem hemisphere of the brain. Language disorders involve expression and comprehension of written and spoken words. A lot of times these people, you'll, you'll think they can write it down if they can't speak it, and they also lose the, lose the ability to write anything down. Um, dysphagia is the inability, impaired ability to communicate. Used interchangeably with aphasia. I think dysphagia is inability. Swallow. Difficult, able, able right, yeah. Yeah, I think aphasia is usually used. Non-fluent, minimal speech activity with a slow speech. A lot of times they'll be slow to respond. You'll ask them a question. If you don't give them time to answer, you think that they don't have the ability to speak. So give them time. Um, then fluent speech is present but contains little meaningful com communication. They'll have something like word salad where they just put out words that don't make any sense when joined together and you're like, oh, okay. Many patients experience dysarthria, which is disturbance in the muscular control of speech. So their mouth can make the words, but they may have a slur. Um, it can be just a little bit and you almost don't catch it or it can be so bad that you don't understand anything that's coming out. Um, can involve pronunciation, articulation, and phonation. Does not affect the meaning of the communication. So it won't be like a word salad, but it's just hard to understand them. Patients who suffer a stroke may have difficulty controlling their emotions. Has anybody seen that commercial with... Uh, uh, Danny Glover, where he talks about his dad, that um, disappropriate emotional response to things. Something could just make them absolutely cry for no reason. They're difficult for their families to understand at that point. Um, they can be triggered or exaggerated or unpredictable and magnified by depression, changes in their body image and the loss of function. Intellectual function, both memory and judgment may be impaired as a result of a stroke. Although impairments can occur with strokes affecting either side of the brain, some deficits are related to the hemisphere in which the stroke occurred. Um, we talked about left brain and right brain damage. Spatial and perceptual alterations to stroke on the right side of the brain is more likely to cause problems in that um, orientation. Incorrect perception of their self and their illness. A unilateral neglect of the affected side. Uh, talks about their um, whether or not they can see on that left side and which portion of their sight is affected. Sometimes they can see central but not uh, peripheral. Then um, they may be divided into four categories. The first is due to damage of the parietal lobe and causes the patient to have an incorrect perception of their self and illness. In this situation, patients may deny that illness and not recognize their own body parts. They see their hand as being almost foreign. They'll kind of react to it with shock, like, oh, I didn't realize that was even there. Um, and it's difficult to have any kind of balance or um, gait when you don't recognize this, a whole side of your body. Then... Um, second category occurs when the patient neglects all input from the affected side an erroneous perception of self in space. This may be worsened by homonymous 
hemianopsia, in which blindness occurs in the same half of the visual fields of both eyes. The patient also has difficulty with spatial orientation, such as judging distances. So they'll lose their independence in a way where they can no longer drive. Uh, they no longer enjoy things like watching television, or um, they, you know, sometimes can end up being more of a hermit than they used to be, and that causes depression as well. Uh, problems with elimination. Most problems with urinary and bowel elimination occur initially and are temporary. You can put people on a toileting schedule, and if you get them to actually uh, train their brain to go again, they can relearn that function. <coughs> when a stroke affects one hemisphere of the brain, prognosis for normal bladder function is excellent. Um, could also be related to the inability to verbalize the need to eliminate and difficulty with managing clothing, resulting in incontinence. Diagnostic studies are done to confirm that it's a stroke, identify the likely cause of a stroke. Um, an MRI or a non-contrast CT scan can indicate the size and location of the lesion and differentiate between ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. It is important to rule out the presence of a different kind of brain lesion. You guys are going to go into your groups and do little um, presentations of different things that can mimic a stroke. Um, tests also guide decisions about the therapy to prevent a secondary stroke. Serial CT scans may be used to assess the effectiveness of treatment and to evaluate recovery. And rapid access to these diagnostic tools is important since the results will determine treatment options for the patient. Um, there's also CTA. They can do a CTA of the head and neck if a patient can't go through an MRA. It's going to show all of the blood flow that they're getting. Carotid um, ultrasounds uh, are essential to know that there's not um, embolic strokes coming from plaque built up in your carotid artery, arteries. And cerebral angiography, digital subtraction angiography, transcranial Doppler. Doppler ultrasonography, a lumbar puncture, they'll do that to see if there's any bleeding that might be subarachnoid, um, Lycox system, and cardiac imaging. They also want to know if there's AFib, if there's any clots in the heart that might be um, putting the patient at risk for further stroke, and then they also want to know how it was caused so that they can treat it. Um, you find yourself very fond of the patient we talked about before. His wife calls you their adopted granddaughter and brings you cookies and treats. Is it okay to accept these gifts? I guess it really depends on your facility's um, policies. Most of the time, it's okay to accept the gifts if you can share them with the other um, people on your unit and things like that, of course, depending on whether or not they're in isolation or you're, you know, got some questions about if they have 16 dogs in the house and there's hair in the food, things like that. Um, but it's, you know, you don't want to hurt their feelings, definitely, but you have to follow your facilities policies. And how involved should you get with your patients? They're calling you their adopted granddaughter, preferring you to take over care instead of a different nurse. Just want to think about how that's going to affect everyone else in the situation, especially the patients. <laughs> yeah. And they'll do it in front of the oncoming nurse. If I'm leaving for the night and I give them to another nurse, they're like, oh, you're leaving? You know, they get attached. You've, you've offered them care that they can't do for themselves. But you also want to, if in that situation, you want to um, up talk your next nurse. Be like, hey, I've worked with Sheila for 10 years, and she is amazing. I would let her take care of me or my parents. She's going to make me look bad, you know, <laughs> just like make sure that they feel comfortable with the person coming on. And sometimes you have to take yourself off of their care as well. If it becomes too attached, uh, it can be detrimental. You want to just be like, hey, you know, maybe somebody else should take over this person's care because it, there's a fine line that might be getting crossed here. Should we refer to our older patients as family members with terms of endearment such as grandma and grandpa? No. no. And I've had patients that they want to be called grandma and grandpa. Um, I also have a problem with this myself, um, not with grandma and grandpa, but in the South, everybody is honey baby sweetie. And a lot of times people think that's condescending. So I am always like, is, are you feeling okay, hon? 
And um, if the patient takes that uh, negatively, then I'm in big trouble. It's hard. It's very hard. And sir, here we call our patients by their first names a lot. I'm very uncomfortable with that. So I just usually will explain it and be like, I'll try to call you what you would like me to call you, but it's not always easy. Um, health promotion is essential. Management of the modifiable risk, modifiable risk factors, like I said, healthy diet. You can print them out, educational materials, and document that you did it. That's a huge deal. Um, help them with weight control, regular exercise. They want to start out very slow, especially if their hypertension is not controlled, but they just want to continue to build up their stamina and cardiac um, strength. No smoking, limited uh, alcohol consumption, blood pressure management, oops, sorry, and routine health assessments. These people are usually going to see their primary care provider or a neurologist um, repeatedly for a short period of time, and then it's essential for them to know that they need to continue to follow up every six months to a year, even when things seem fine. Um, preventative drug therapy measures to prevent development of a thrombus or embolus are used in patients at risk for stroke. Antiplatelet drugs are used in patients who have had a TI, A, related to arth atherosclerosis, plaque buildup. Aspirin is most frequently used antiplatelet agent. Um, the common dose for aspirin is 81 to 325 milligrams a day, depending on your risk factors. Um, others include Tyclid, Plavix, Percentine, and then Agronox, which is a combination um, uh, with an asp it's actually got an aspirin pill inside of it. Um, for patients who have AFib, they can be on Coumadin or um, direct factor XA inhibitors like Xarelto, Pradaxa, and Eliquis, which um, used to be a huge risk because they didn't have reversal agents that were easy to acquire. So, um, and it, their uh, bleeding risk is not measured with the typical PTINR that we use in the hospital. So now those reversal agents are becoming more uh, appropriately um, acquirable. And so Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa, things like that, uh, they're more focused on certain inhibitors that the patient may need controlled. And um, they, the people are uh, trying them more often and not stuck to getting their blood drawn every couple days or week like they were with Coumadin. Uh, and then a statin also is usually prescribed to lower their um, cholesterol. Surgical interventions for patients with TIAs from carotid disease are carotid endorectomy, where they go in and they scrape out all the plaque in your carotid arteries. This does, however, um, carry with it a huge risk for an embolic stroke after that scrape. Sometimes pieces can still break off. Um, so they usually monitor somebody in the hospital that's at great risk for 24 hours to make sure that they don't have a stroke after that procedure. There's transluminal angioplasty and stenting. Um, just like a cardiac stent, they can go in there and open that artery up so that blood flow is adequate to supply the brain. There's a picture of your anatomy. A theromatous lesion is removed for the carotid artery to improve blood flow, which is called a plaque. <laughs> um, performed to prevent impending cerebral infarction. So if they're 70% occluded um, or higher, they usually go in there. Sometimes they will only do the left. Sometimes <clears throat> they'll only do the right. Sometimes the patient is 90% occluded in both carotid arteries, and they'll go in and uh, scrape both of them. Um, a brain stent is used to treat blockages in cerebral blood flow. A balloon catheter is used to implant the stent into an artery of the brain. That balloon catheter is moved to the blocked area of the brain and then inflated. The stent expands due to the inflation of the balloon. The balloon is deflated and withdrawn, and the stent stays permanently in place, holding that artery open and improving the flow of blood. And postoperative care is important. Neurovascular assessments repeatedly... Um, if they're in the ICU, it's going to be every hour, PCU every two hours. You're going to be watching for any kind of deterioration of um, neurologic function. Manage their blood pressure, assess for complications. Sometimes the stent can be occluded. 
um, and they're going to have symptoms of TIAs, and they can have a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Um, you're going to minimize complications at the insertion site by keeping the patient's leg straight for the prescribed amount of time. Um, sometimes they'll have you uh, with the position of the bed in a certain spot, um, 30 degree angle, making sure that their head is straight so that they're getting adequate flow to blow both carotids. Goals for interprofessional care are obviously preserving life, preventing any further brain damage, and reducing disability. Time of onset of symptoms is critical information. The most critical information, though, is time that they last saw a patient normal. Most um, family members are going to bring their patient in and, and say, I was talking to them on the phone and I couldn't understand anything they said. And they're going to focus on the time that they noticed the symptoms. But what you really want to know is the last time the patient was seen normal because they could have suffered those symptoms any time between those two points in time. And your um, acute care for ischemic stroke begins with managing the airway, breathing, and circulation like anything else, the ABCs. Um, oh, sorry. I think that's time to pick up my kid from school and it's closed. Uh, and um, table 57.7 in your book outlines the emergency management of the patient with a stroke, which can happen in any setting, can happen at home. Um, it's just important to know, the, especially the very first steps um, to managing somebody who has stroke symptoms. It can be difficult to keep an open and clear airway because of a decreased level of consciousness or decreased or absent gag reflex. Um, they're going to administer oxygen, sometimes insert an artificial airway, intubate, and then mechanical ventilation may be required depending on the area of the stroke. Baseline neurological assessment. You're going to monitor closely for signs of increasing neurological deficit and increased intracranial pressure. Um, if, if you're noticing a really high systolic blood pressure and a really low diastolic pressure, um, sometimes that can be symptoms. Elevated BP is common immediately after a stroke, and it may reflect the body's attempt to maintain cerebral perfusion. So it's going to pump harder and stronger to get enough blood flow through to that injured area. You're going to control fluid and electrolyte balance, adequate hydration. It might be IV if they can't swallow. Um, promotes perfusion and decreases further brain injury. Manage Management of uh, intracranial pressure is, um, if there's a really big problem, usually going to happen in the ICU. Um, use interventions that improve venous drainage, that which also is keeping the head midline so that uh, the carotids are open and um, there's no kinking off of anything that might help drainage or perfusion. Um, Overhydration may compromise perfusion by increasing cerebral edema. So the doctor's going to be very um, interested in how much they're taking in and how much they're putting out. Um, if secretion of antidiuretic hormone increases in response to the stroke, urine output decreases, fluid is retained, low serum sodium is common, um, hyponatremia. IV solutions with glucose in water are avoided because they're hyper hypotonic and may further increase the cerebral edema and ICP. Um, you're really going to want to manage a blood sugar. Um, recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, TPA. Uh, TPA is considered a clot buster um, used to reestablish the blood flow through a blocked artery to prevent cell death. It must be administered within three to four and a half hours of onset of clinical signs of ischemic stroke the reason for that is after four and a half hours, it becomes too high of a risk for patients and it can cause a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, patients are carefully screened. Um, typical things that are going to prevent them getting TPA are if they're already on a blood thinner such as Coumadin, then TPA is too big of a risk. That's why it's so important to know that uh, last time the patient was seen normal because that's the time frame they're looking at that's appropriate to give TPA. After the patient has stabilized and to prevent further clot formation, patients with strokes caused by thrombi and emboli may be treated with anticoagulants and platelet inhibitors such as aspirin, Ticlid, Plavix, Agrinox. Um, 
and stent retrievers becoming the most effective way of managing ischemic stroke. Um, such as solitaire are a way of opening blocked arteries in the brain by using a removable stent system. During the procedure, a catheter is used to guide the small stent from the femoral artery in the groin area, effect, area to the affected artery in the brain. The stent is guided with neuroimaging into the part of the artery where a blood clot has formed. The stent expands the interior walls of the artery and allows blood to get to the patient's brain immediately to prevent as much damage as possible. The clot seeps into the mesh of the stent. Then after a few minutes, the stent and clot are removed together. Um, I've seen this done, but only in the biggest hospitals. So um, if you're screening a patient on whether or not they're adequate for TPA and they haven't been seen normal for greater than four and a half hours, uh, a lot of times you can send them to um, University of Washington. They might airlift them to University of Washington if they feel that uh, this type of procedure might regain them function. And they can pull out a gigantic clot with these things. Uh, the goals are the same as for the patient with an ischemic stroke, acute care for hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, manage airway, breathing, and circulation. Um, these people are typically going to have a decreased level of consciousness more so than a, an ischemic stroke. So they might already come in um, on the ambulance intubated, um, and they're going to have trouble managing intracranial pressure. Uh, drug therapy for hemorrhagic stroke, anticoagulants, and platelet inhibitors are contraindicated because they're going to increase the amount of blood that's pooling in the brain. Um, management of hypertension is the main focus so that there's not more rupture and bleeding. Oral and IV agents are used to maintain BP within a normal to high normal range. If you're systolic, they want to keep the systolic blood pressure less than 160, but they want to keep it... Um, it's kind of a game managing that with hemorrhagic stroke because they also want to make sure that the rest of the brain is still being perfused adequately. So if you're having a systolic blood pressure lower than 90, that's a problem. Um, seizure prophylaxis is situation specific. They might give them Dilantin, um, something like that to prevent seizures if they think it's a high risk or if they've seen them already. Surgical therapy for hemorrhagic strokes um, include resection, clipping of an aneurysm, evacuation of hematomas, um, and the procedure is chosen based on cause of a stroke. Um, the, uh, the size of the hematomas and how much pressure it's putting on the rest of the brain is going to be the indicator. A lot of times if it's a small bleed, they might just wait for it to kind of absorb back into the brain tissue. But if they're seeing shifting of that brain matter, then they can go in, drill holes for pressure, um, and evacuate the clot. The risk for that is they can create more bleeding. Um, that is a picture of a berry aneurysm and a metal clip. Uh, in a subarachnoid hemorrhage, bleeding from a damaged vessel causes blood to accumulate between the brain and skull. Sorry. Oh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is usually caused by a ruptured aneurysm. Sometimes they start having horrible headaches and they can go in for MRIs and they catch these aneurysms, these big bulging parts um, where blood is accumulating and the vessel walls are getting weak and they can go in and put a metal clip around it to decrease the patient's risk for a rupture. Um, like it said, a lot of times it's a silent killer and there's no um, warning, but sometimes they can actually go in and find something and decrease that risk. A GDC coil, the picture of the procedure on how they do that. A hydrogel coated platinum coil is used to occlude an aneurysm. The softness of the platinum allows the coil to assume the shape of irregularly shaped aneurysms while posing little threat of rupture of the aneurysm. Um, they go through an artery in the leg and thread it up to the cerebral blood vessels. And acute care for hemorrhagic stroke, hyperdynamic therapy, increased mean arterial pressure, cerebral perfusion, and then a crystalloid or colloid solution for hydration. Basospasms can be treated with calcium channel blockers, nemotipine, 
Um, after annual, an, aneurysmal occlusion via clipping or coiling, hyperdynamic therapy um, may hyperdynamic therapy, hemodilution induced hypertension using vasoconstrictive agents such as phenylephrine or dopamine um, may be instituted in an effort to increase the mean arterial pressure and increase cerebral perfusion. They're most of the time again going to be in the ICU while they're monitoring these post procedures. Your patient that we talked about before, PD, is diagnosed with the thrombotic stroke. Over the next 72 hours, you plan your care with the knowledge that he, A, is ready for aggressive rehabilitation, B, will show gradual improvement of the initial neurological deficits, C, may show signs of deteriorating neurological function as cerebral edema increases, or D, should not be turned or exercised to prevent extension of the thrombus and increased neurological deficits. So he's had a thrombotic stroke, and in 72 hours, you're thinking that which answer is appropriate? C. C. Yes. Ischemic stroke symptoms may progress in the first 72 hours as infarction and cerebral edema increase. So you're going to be monitoring frequently. <clears throat> and at times, you're going to be waking them up if you work nights. Um, once the patient is stable, it's okay that they sleep through the night, but you need to know if there's any progression of that stroke. After stroke has stabilized for 12 to 24 hours, interprofessional care shifts from preserving life to lessening disability and attaining optimal functioning. This is the time your case management is going to get involved and see if they might need a, um, an inpatient rehab facility where they can get help with physical therapy, occupational therapy. Speech therapy does a lot of wonders for um, patients that have suffered a stroke even if speech is not their main disability. Um, uh, core measures for stroke, your venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. If, if they've had a hemorrhagic stroke, this is things like putting them in TED hose. Um, ischemic strokes discharged on antithrombotic therapy, anticoagulation therapy for AFib to decrease the incidence of stroke. Um, anti-thrombotic therapy by end of hospital day two. So these are all things that are measured by joint commission, stroke core measures, and um, you'll usually have like a stroke, stroke order set and you make sure that the doctor has ordered all of these preventative measures so that the patient is covered and the hospital is covered. Um, your nursing assessment is focused on their cardiac status, their respiratory status, and their neuro status. Um, if the patient is stable, obtain a description of the current illness, pay special attention to symptom onset and duration, nature, and changes. If the patient is stable, also obtain history of similar symptoms previously experienced, current medications, history of risk factors and other illnesses like hypertension, and their family history of stroke, aneurysm, or cardiovascular disease. Secondary assessment includes a comprehensive Comprehensive neurological examination. You're going to check their level of consciousness, including the NIH stroke scale. And I posted a, an example of a doctor doing an exam on a patient of the actual NIH stroke scale. Um, certain nurses, your rapid response, ICU, ED nurses are going to take this test every year. And the videos are a little outdated, but it does tell you, um, shows you patients that do have um, some high, uh, high levels of stroke scale, eight eight or above on the NIH stroke scale um, is usually going to get them a CAT scan with uh, I can't think of the word now. <laughs> um, anyway, to see uh, if they can reverse some of those symptoms as fast as possible. Uh, you're going to cognition, you're going to ask them what day it is. Simple questions and they're going to laugh at you and sometimes they Depending on the side of the stroke, they're going to pretend that they know. I know where I am. Do you know where you are? But you're going to have to say, I know, it's ridiculous, but please tell me, what day is it? Or if they can't pinpoint things, you're going to ask them, who is the president? Um, just minor questions that are going to tell you if they are alert and oriented times four. You're going to check their motor abilities, have them grasp your hands, things like that. Um, preferably both sides at, the, at a time, and Donette showed you that too. Um, it's kind of hard to tell if there's weakness to one side or the other if you have them grab one hand and then grab the other later. 
uh, check their cranial nerve function, sensation, their proprioception, have them walk back and forth for you, uh, cerebellar function, make sure that their balance is good and their deep tendon reflexes. <clears throat> Nursing diagnoses are uh, include but are not limited to decreased intracranial adaptive capacity, a risk for aspiration, impaired physical mobility, impaired verbal communication, unilateral neglect, impaired swallowing, situational low self-esteem, especially in younger people that are having strokes and are impaired, they're going to have a serious problem with self-esteem. Um, planning for the patient, goals include that patients will maintain stable or improved level of consciousness, number one, attain maximum physical functioning, maximize self-care abilities and skills, and maintain stable body functions. Um, anytime a patient comes in with a stroke, the doctor initially orders PTOT speech because they want them to start from the get-go trying to get these patients' um, disability as less as possible. Um, goals include that the patient will maximize communication abilities, maintain adequate nutrition, avoid complications of the stroke, and maintain effective personal and family coping. And nursing, nursing implementation, health promotion. You have an important role in the promotion of a healthy lifestyle. To, reduce, to help reduce the incidence of stroke, <clears throat> focus on stroke prevention. Teach how to reduce modifiable risk factors because they are the cause of most strokes. Nursing measures to reduce risk factors for stroke are similar to those for coronary artery disease. And we talked about that. The respiratory system, management of respiratory system is a nursing priority. Risk for atelectasis, you want to make sure that you're sending them home if they've got trouble taking deep breaths with an incentive spirometer and teaching them how to use it appropriately so they don't end up with um, lung damage or pneumonia. Their risk for aspiration pneumonia, sometimes they'll have to go home on a pureed diet. Um, and you want to make sure that they understand that. A lot of times they'll keep asking you for thin liquids if they're not appropriate for them and they're going to choke. You just keep reminding them what's going to happen if that does occur. Uh, risks for airway obstruction, they may require endotrach endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. Neurologic system, monitor closely to detect changes suggesting an extension of the stroke. If your patient um, had an NIH stroke scale and you got report from the ER nurse and you're on the inpatient unit and they say, oh, they passed their swallow screen and um, they're alert and oriented times four and they just have a little left-sided weakness and you get them up to the floor and they have pupil dilation and one pupil doesn't react and they're no longer able to tell you things. Um, those are things that you need to talk to the doctor about immediately. Um, increased intracranial pressure, vasospasm, recovery from stroke symptoms. That's why we repeat the NIH stroke scale. Um, usually, usually they'll do it in the ER, they'll do it on the floor when the patient gets there, and then they'll do it 24 hours later to make sure that everything is the same because it's a constant tool. You should get the same answer as the nurse previously if the patient is still in the same condition. Um, cardiovascular system goals aimed at, <clears throat> excuse me, maintaining homeostasis. Many patients with stroke have decreased cardiac reserves from secondary diagnoses of cardiac disease and cardiac efficiency may be compromised. Um, Nursing interventions, monitoring vital signs frequently, monitoring cardiac rhythms, they are gonna be on telemetry um, at least for 24 hours after a stroke, calculating intake and output, noting imbalances, and regulating IV infusions. Adjusting fluid intake to individual needs of the patient, monitoring lung sounds for crackles and wheezes, especially if they're on constant fluid. Sometimes the doctors just miss that they might be at risk for congestive heart failure or fluid overload. Uh, watch for orthostatic hypotension before you ambulate the patient for the first time. Um, have them sit at the side of the bedside before they stand up and see if they suffer any dizzy, dizziness, nauseous, um, things like that, weakness. Um, don't just let them stand up super quick and try to take off. After stroke, patient is at risk for venous thromboembolism. Um, weak or paralyzed lower extremities are particularly vulnerable because the blood is going to pool without the active uh, movement of the muscles.
related to immobility, loss of venous tone, and decreased muscle pumping in the leg. The most effective prevention is keeping the patient moving. We also have um, SCDs and TED hose um, to increase that venous return. So getting back to PD, when you go to get him out of bed and ready for therapy, he refuses to participate in transferring out of the bed. Although he has seemed down throughout his hospital stay, he never refused to participate in the plan of care. What should you do? What's the first thing you would ask the patient if he's usually participating in care and all of a sudden he's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not getting out of bed today. Exactly. Like ask him, what's going on with you? Or what, what's different from today than was from yesterday? Yesterday you got up and walked out, you know, around the unit. Um, you want to encourage him to talk to you. Sometimes it helps to sit down and be at eye level with the patient. They feel a little bit more comfortable and not like you're talking down to them and you're not the healthcare guru, you're just a common person. Um, assess him carefully to make sure his stroke has not progressed. You want to then, if he seems off, ask him the same boring questions. Tell me your name. Tell me your date of birth. What day is it today? Give him time to wake up if he's not had any sleep. Maybe he's just been woken up all night. Talk with him to determine the cause of the change in behavior. Is he sick? Is he depressed? Is his condition worse? Musculoskeletal system. The goal is to maintain optimal function. You can accomplish this by prevention of joint contractures and muscular atrophy. Uh, we had a patient yesterday in the clinical setting that had a right-sided stroke. So she was completely flaccid on the left side and um, was teaching the first-year student that she wanted her arm elevated on a pillow, but when you did that, her hands were like this. So physical therapy hadn't been in yet to see her and provide her with a splint or whatever necessary to keep those fingers straight. But if you don't keep straightening them and positioning them appropriately, those tendons tighten and the patient will end up contracted, you know, sometimes severely where they can't even stretch their arm out. And it's uncomfortable for them. Um, in acute phases, range of motion, exercise, and positioning are important. Paralyzed or weak side needs special attention when positioned. Uh, she probably also doesn't know that that side exists with the left side and neglect that's common. And so sometimes you'll accidentally lay the patient on their arm. Just be careful. I do it all the time. But <laughs> make sure that you're, then you roll them back over and you pull the arm out because you would think that the patient is going to protect their own arm. It's just kind of your common perception and they don't. Uh, optimized musculoskeletal function. Trochanter roll at hip to prevent external rotation. Hand cones to prevent hand contractures. Arm supports with slings and lap boards to prevent shoulder displacement. You've got to really be careful because that's the side of the body that's going to be weak and you're going to want to pull that patient up by shoulders. This is the side you're going to pull more on and they can't muscularly protect that shoulder and a lot of times it'll become, um, it'll come out of the socket and then it causes pain. So sometimes they can tape it uh, physical therapy has some uh, this awesome tape that protects things and encourages those muscles to react. Um, Avoidance of pulling the patient by the arm, posterior leg splints, hand splints, we talked about those. Then they're susceptible to skin breakdown related to the loss of sensation, decreased circulation, and immobility. It's compounded by their age, poor nutrition, dehydration, edema, and incontinence. So you're going to provide them with pressure relief, changing their position at least every two hours, even when they're in a wheelchair. Um, they position them on the weak side for only 30 minutes, but they usually will prefer to be on that side because they have more mobility um, on the other side. So when you position them on the strong side, they feel a little bit uh, completely immobile. Um, good skin hygiene, keep them dry and clean, put on skin barriers, uh, and keep them moving as much as possible. Gastrointestinal system, stress of illness contributes to a catabolic state that can interfere with recovery. Constipation is the most common bowel problem because they're not moving. They're not drinking a lot of fluids. Uh, prophylactic stool softeners or fiber and then physical activity. Their urinary system in the acute stage, poor bladder control results in incontinence. And then we talked about improving uh, normal bladder function, sometimes the toileting schedule. Nutritional needs require quick assessment and treatment. They may initially, effuse, in, may initially receive IV infusions and then require nutritional support even after they're discharged. Uh, first feeding should be approached carefully. We're going to check their gag reflex first. 
and um, whether or not they can swallow their own secretions, you know, every time you talk or whatever, you produce uh, saliva. And if they're drooling it out, you know, drooling it down their face, then that usually tells you that they can't swallow it appropriately. And then scrupulous oral hygiene afterwards, a lot of times they'll pocket food in their cheeks and they just don't have the ability to kind of swab it out and get it swallowed. Your role in meeting psychologic needs of patient is primarily supportive. Uh, you're going to assess them. You're going to pass it on to whatever case management is there or physician that the patient just doesn't seem to be coping with this adequately or their family might not be coping with it adequately. Uh, speech comprehension and language deficits are most difficult problem for the patient and the family. They get very frustrated. Um, then visual problems may include double vision, drooping eyelid, loss of corneal reflex, um, peripheral vision loss in both eyes, difficulty in, oh, stroke on the right side of the brain, difficulty in judging position, distance, and movements, impulsive impatient, and eye problems. So safety is the biggest issue with the people with the right-sided brain um, CVAs that are actually going to affect the left side of the body. <clears throat> Patients. Uh, okay, so PD also has dysphagia. Before allowing him to eat, which action should you take first? A, check his gag reflex. B, request a soft diet with no liquids. C, place the patient in high Fowler's position. Or D, test the patient's ability to swallow with a small amount of water. Yes, you're pretty much going to, you're going to do all of these, but this is one of those things which is the most appropriate. Um, and before you check whether they can swallow any kind of liquid or anything, you're going to check their gag reflex. Gently stimulate the back of the throat with a tongue blade. If a gag reflex is present, the patient will gag spontaneously. If it's absent, defer to the feeding or defer the feeding and begin exercises to stimulate swallowing and refer them to speech therapy. Is that something that we, we should be Speech therapy is um, not going to be on scene until, especially if the patient comes in at night or later in the evening, something like that. They have a protocol now, and see that they have a nurse training. Or maybe somebody's on the unit. Uh-huh. The gag reflex and swallow, swallow eval, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So speech yeah. therapy is going to be consulted right away, but they may not always they be on scene. Right. And you want to know if your patient can take their medicines or if they can swallow right. any liquids or food. So that's going to be done mm -hmm. right away. The training to do so, yeah. That's what we used to do. Is, and if there was any question whatsoever, then they had to be in PO until the speech therapy mm -hmm. because they're more highly trained in the... Okay. In the assessment of that, yep. They can do a barium swallow or follow through where they check the patient's um, swallowing a liquid while they x-ray at the same time and see if there's any kind of seepage that's going to affect the lungs. Um... Coping, it's often a family disease. It's going to affect the family emotionally, socially, a lot of times financially, and changing of the roles and responsibilities. A lot of times these are going to be 45-year-old men that are the breadwinner for the family, and all of a sudden they can't move an entire side of their body. Their wife has to figure out how to take care of them and support the family work. Um, and there's a lot of social work help there, case management. Um, and they can get them support that they need. Um, you're going to explain what's happened, the diagnosis, and any therapeutic therapeutic procedures. Sometimes we'll be teaching them how to clean a trach at home so they can take that patient home. Um, and you have to be clear and understood by the patient. And definitely don't try to teach them something that you don't understand. Defer to somebody who does have that training. Um, there's usually no time for preparation and social service referral. What are the priority nursing interventions for PD with the thrombotic stroke? We're going to prevent any complications related to immobility, helping him adjust and cope with the results of the stroke. Discuss what changes they can expect to see as a result of the stroke, and then the focus should be on rehabilitation. What teaching are you going to need to do for him and his family? Right. 
first and foremost, you're going to explain what happened because they're not going to understand. Um, well, some people do, but most of the family is not going to understand this person was walking and talking yesterday and today they're, you know, not able to manage. And then you can discuss what changes they can expect to see as a result of the stroke. Um, you can um, let them know things that they should be concerned with. If he's got a constant headache, um, then he, they need to call the doctor and find out um, anything that's changed in his situation. They're usually going to go to either home or intermediate or long-term care facility or rehab facility that focuses on independence and ADLs. Ongoing rehab is essential to maximize patients' abilities. They may get home health care um, or they may train the uh, family on how to do physical therapy type things. Ambulatory care. Nurses have an excellent opportunity to prepare the patient and family for discharge through teaching, demonstration, return demonstration, practice the value of self-care skills. So when you demonstrate how to do something to the patient or with the family and you want to make sure that that family is going to be able to manage it, have the family show you exactly what you did back to you um, so that you're sure that they can handle it at home. And rehab is the process of maximizing the patient's capabilities and resources to promote optimal functioning, as close to normal as you can uh, get them, physically, mentally, and, and their social well-being. Goals are set mutually by the patient, family, nurse, stroke, rehab team. Um, a patient who had a stroke works with, with a physical therapist to improve her arm strength. And they'll have exercises and um, interventions that are totally guided by where that stroke is and how that patient is managing it. Let's talk more about rehab, complications, cognitive status, resources, and this is an example of um, the perception of a patient with homonymous hemonopsia shows that the food on the left side is not seen and so it's ignored. So sometimes the either family or the rehab staff is going to have to learn that they have to turn the plate um, halfway through the meal because they'll see and it's absolute like straight down the plate sometimes where the patient just has no idea that anything on that left side exists. Um, walking, eating, toileting. I wanted to try to get through this uh, to explain to you guys the most important steps if you think a patient is having a stroke in, in the order that's most appropriate. Uh, the prognosis is poor if a patient is still completely flaccid several weeks after the stroke. They're probably not going to regain function. The poor lady can't move anything on the left side there. Balance training, transferring from the bed to the chair, that's definitely something you guys can help with. Don't have to be trained for that, um, especially. Low bath method or constraint-induced movement therapy may be used. Sometimes they'll have adaptive equipment and... Um, these are some tools for eating. See the curved knife there so that they can cut because they might not have fine motor ability. Um, they may have tremors. They may need sippy cups for a while. Um, implement a bowel management program for constipation and incontinence. And a high fiber diet and adequate fluid intake. And then the atypical emotional response, distract the patient when they start having an inappropriate emotional response, try to get them talking about something else and maybe that might kind of untrigger that outburst. Maintain a calm environment, yelling at them is not gonna help, shaming or scolding them. Um, patient with a stroke may be coping with many losses, often go through the process of grief, long-term depression, and then long-term depression, and then you have a role in supporting their coping. Make sure that they're communicating with each other. Lifestyle changes are being discussed. Um, ask them how they're going to manage it. If they seem like they just don't quite understand, you just want to make sure that everything is out in the open because it can be more difficult for them than they realize and you don't want the patient suffering for that. Um, family members must cope with three aspects of the patient's behavior. Recognition of behavioral changes resulting from neurological defects that are not changeable. Responses to multiple losses both by the patient and family. And behaviors that may have been reinforced during the early stages of stroke as continued dependency. A lot of times they'll want to do everything for them at first. You have to convince them that that patient needs to try for themselves first. Stroke support groups within rehab facilities and community are helpful. 
sexual function is difficult to talk to your patients about, but um, it's something that they may be concerned about. A lot of times that's an intimate part of their relationship and they're very upset at having to give it up and concerned with um, how their partner is going to react and if they'll stay in the relationship or not. Many patients are comfortable talking about their anxieties and fears regarding sexual function if the nurse is comfortable and open to the topic. It's kind of something that you have to just train yourself to handle once the patient brings it up if that happens. It can be kind of uncomfortable, especially if the patient is 85 and you're kind of like, oh, okay, yeah. Go ahead and talk to me about that if you really want to. Um, stroke is a significant cause of death and disability. We talked about it. it's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, significant costs are generated in the last two years of an, an older adult's life. How does your position about healthcare resource allocation for care of the older old adult influence how you approach their care? So what do you guys know about healthcare resources, costs of healthcare, aging, and the quality of life? Do you think that all elderly people are covered by Medicare and that they can afford every portion of their healthcare costs? Yeah. No. Do you think that they might have to balance sometimes food and medication? Sometimes they have no transportation, no family support. In this country, we don't... Um, idolize and take care of our elderly like we should sometimes. Families are not always involved in taking care of them. They can't afford their anticoagulants and they will not tell their doctor that because they don't want to hear a lesson. So they just won't take their Coumadin and then they have a stroke. Um, it's just something that you want to talk to them about. A lot of them are uncomfortable telling you that they don't have the money, you know, but you want to make sure that the patient is going to adhere to what is going to save their life, make their quality of life better. So it didn't used to be that way. We didn't spend most of our time talking about whether or not the patient could afford their medications and things like that. But as healthcare insurance and things like that changes, it's a part of our, part of our job. <clears throat> Education and questioning the patient. So um, I wanted to talk to you guys about if you notice that a patient has some stroke symptoms or a family member, anybody that you are witnessing, um, the most important thing is that you either call 911 or rapid response if you're in the inpatient setting, um, uh, that you get reinforcements. And the ultimate thing you're trying to do is get that patient to a CAT scan within um, 90 minutes if you're an outlier like we are. Uh, sometimes they'll lifelight them out if the patient was seen normal because time is a big deal. Um, you've seen the uh, mnemonic FAST, and now they've added a couple things to it too, but uh, FAST is the most appropriate so far. Uh, if you notice anything wrong with your face, you try to smile in a mirror and half of your face is not reacting. Um, your arm, if you can't lift your arm, your leg also is involved in that. Um, your speech, if you can't say what you need to say or people can't understand you, people are looking at you funny, and then time. It is essential that they get them to the CAT scan. What the CAT scan is going to do is rule out a bleed in the head. So if a patient um, is coming into, the, into your setting and has this, you're going to want to be asking questions about their medication. Are you already on a uh, blood thinner um, as you're getting them to a CAT scan? Uh, you'll be putting in an IV and drawing blood so they can check their levels and make sure they're not at higher risk for a bleed if they get the clot buster, TPA, um, or some such medication, depends on what they have. Um, and then you're going to go with your patient to the CAT scanner because you're the one that most appropriately knows their health history, what's been going on exactly, what symptoms are there, and if they're worse or better than they were when they came in. Um, and then sometimes you'll actually talk to the radiologist you're going to do an NIH stroke scale if you're qualified to do so, or you're going to have the rapid response nurse doing that. And uh, the radiologist is going to say, okay, exactly what kind of symptoms are you seeing? And uh, what are you most concerned with with this patient? Is this, you know, um, and if that patient has an NIH stroke scale over eight, they're usually going to do a CT with contrast of the head that Florida's trying to come up with. 
then you're going to want to find out before that happens if the patient has any allergies. If they're allergic to contrast, they're allergic to iodine, they're allergic to shrimp, they're going to worry about that. Um, they may have to go with an MRI. You're usually not going to get an MRI um, in the ER in the acute phase. Uh, they may repeat a CT in 24 hours because initially you're not going to see that damaged area. It's going to take about 24 hours for you to see that, what they call the peduncle. Um, it's a kind of a gray area that shows up in the brain of where there was no blood flow and which area is damaged. Um, so just be thinking about those things in the back of your mind because you might freak out. If it's your family member or something, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. This is not... This is not the way this patient normally acts or not the way this family member normally acts. Um, don't give them aspirin. A lot of people will think just as in a heart attack, you're going to give the patient aspirin. But if you do so, they might not be a candidate for TPA. Sometimes if the patient gets TPA within the allotted amount of time, they're going to completely come back to normal. You can absolutely save their function and they won't be disabled. Uh, hemorrhagic strokes are not so... The prognosis is not so great, but you still want them to get care so that the bleed can be controlled as much as possible in the hospital setting. Do you guys have any questions? You have the PowerPoint there. It's got most of that information on it, and hopefully you can look at it. And in combination with Donette saying, I think, you know, she, man she managed the function of all the cranial nerves and the portions of the brain. And then I kind of told you what happens if you don't have function in those sides of the brain. So more times you are confronted with it, the more times it's kind of going to ring a bell. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um.